is actually give you an overview of what we are doing now. And there was a time before COVID. And the time before COVID, when we would work in our laboratory, we would work in the biosafety level three facility. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But basically those were happy times. And so here we are in PPE. We are getting set to do an experiment and you'll notice that everyone has smiles. This is a nice, smiley, happy time. Why? Because they're graduate students and the graduate students are working. So this is uh, one student I'll talk late, about later. This is Nathan Prokobigas. He is a graduate student in my lab. And what we were researching is we were researching the ability of nanoparticles to deliver effective antimicrobials to these devastating diseases. These are zoonotic agents. This is brucella, burkholderia, and francisella. They cause brucellosis, glanders, and miliodosis, and tularemia or rabbit fever. These are all highly infectious bacterial pathogens via the aerosol route. They are all facultative intracellular pathogens of mammals. They are inherently resistant to antibiotics. They are recalcitrant to therapies. They are very slow growing and they have a lot of antimicrobial methods that are built into these organisms and some of which are due to the cell envelope characteristics that help repel uh, small molecules and antibiotics. The symptomology that we have is, uh, for these diseases, although these are separate diseases, they all have similarities in that they cause pneumonia, fever, headaches. There are no vaccines in humans. These are zoonoses, as I indicated, and relapses are very common. So natural infection does not impart resistance to the disease. So I'm gonna come back to this topic, but I'm just gonna mention now that because these are highly infectious and they cause devastating diseases in humans, they are select agents. And that is research with these agents is restricted within the United States and broadly throughout the rest of the world. Here in the US, they are also referred to as tier one pathogens, which means they have extra scrutiny for all of the research. And this requires biosafety level three facilities, as well as animal biosafety level three facilities if you're going to do in vivo work with small animals. So here's just some examples of the types of therapies that demonstrating how uh, difficult it is to treat uh, for Burkholderia, it requires an intensive phase of IV antibiotics of ceftazidime or carbapenem. And then you get 12 weeks of an oral phase. This is the eradication phase with trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole. Brucella requires 12 to 18 weeks for doxy and streptomycin, both of those drugs. And francisella requires one to two weeks. I just want you to take away from this slide that we are researching devastating chronic facultative intracellular pathogens of mammals. And this is just demonstrating the type of work that we do in the BSL-3. We are investigating a nanoparticle delivery system that has the drug meropenem. I just want you to see that we have a intracellular bacterial survival assay. We treat with drugs and we're able to track the survival of the bacteria inside of macrophages that have been infected over a period of of 24 hours. So we're able to evaluate the efficacy of these drugs. We're also able to evaluate their safety in a BSL-2 laboratory. And the other thing we're able to do is um, for the safety of the drugs, we conduct uh, lactate dehydrogenase assays. This is a cytotoxicity assay. So release of LDH is measured on the y-axis over the percent cytotoxicity. And we also have the measurement of the metabolic activity. This is an indicator about the overall survival of these cells in tissue culture. I'm mentioning these because this is the kind of work that we were doing prior to the COVID outbreak. And the research leads us to identify that the nanoparticles were able to be internalized by infected cells. Here, the nanoparticles are in this cyan color. The Purple color is the uh, bacteria, which we've identified via an antibody. So we can take infected cells, we can give them nanoparticles, and the nanoparticles will eventually release the drug. And so this is an effective way to deliver drugs inside of cells 
that uh, contain a pathogen. Now, that's the work that we were doing. And that gets classified as emerging pathogen research because these are emerging pathogens. They are also biowarfare agents. These are listed as a risk group three, which is due to the fact that they cause high morbidity and high mortality. Um, they are facultative intracellular pathogens. We do the tissue modeling, and we also do in vivo testing in small rodents, mainly mice. So once we started getting cases of COVID-19, uh, remember coronaviruses are not new. We've known about coronaviruses for a long time, since the 70s. However, this particular disease of uh, the severe acute respiratory syndrome is referred to as SARS. The current outbreak of 2019 is due to this virus that was subsequently named SARS-CoV-2. The previous SARS was just CoV-1. Um, it is also a zoonotic emerging uh, pathogen that also has, as we've now realized, severe pandemic potential. It requires biosafety level three facilities. It is also risk group three, high morbidity and high mortality. In contrast, it's a virus. So this is an obligate intracellular pathogen. And so what I would like to demonstrate is that we will use a lot of the same techniques that we have, that we have developed in the laboratory to study these bacterial pathogens. We will use those same techniques to study coronavirus disease it, during this current outbreak. So what is it that we need for this current outbreak? Well, one, we need to develop a system to model the disease in tissue culture. There's a lot of research that has been done since 2002. However, as we can see, we still need to know more about the disease process so that we can effectively develop therapies as well as a vaccine. Uh, we also need to test new antivirals and we also need to be able to test these within animals. So this is what our laboratory set out to do. So just a brief overview of coronaviruses. They are a positive single-stranded RNA envelope virus. The major protein that a lot of attention is paid to is the spike protein. This is on the surface of the virus. Uh, the envelope is acquired from the cell that it previously infected. One key aspect to the spike protein is that it must be cleaved by host proteases in order for it to develop its ability to fuse with host membranes. The coronaviruses are broken up into alpha and beta clades. Now, coronaviruses cause about 32% of, uh, of all colds with the remaining number of colds due to rhinovirus and adenovirus. Coronaviruses exhibit a lot of host species restrictions and I have a few of those listed here. And a the host restriction is mainly due to the receptor ligand specificity from the spike protein for a number of these host receptor molecules. And I'm gonna focus mainly on two. That's ACE2, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme two that's present on humans. That uh, causes the predilection for SARS to infect humans as well as other animal species. And there is another coronavirus that also has caused outbreaks, and that's the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. It is different in that it will recognize the DPPR receptor, and that's also referred to as the CD26. That is a dipeptidase, uh, by dipeptidal peptidase 4 membrane protein on target cells. And so there's a variety of other uh, potential targets that people would use for antiviral therapies that will focus on a number of these uh, activities of the spike protein and be able to restrict their ability to bind host cells. Now this is just a very brief progression of coronaviruses and demonstrating that it's zoonotic and an emerging disease. In 2002 and 2003, a coronavirus outbreak was caused by a virus that previously was localized within pangolins, which is this uh, armored little critter here. And within humans, it caused pulmonary distress. And so we got the atypical pneumonia that was described. This was fever, headache, onset of respiratory syndromes, which includes cough, uh, dyspnea, and pneumonia. The outbreak reached 29 countries. There were 8,000 confirmed cases, just contrast to what we have now. 
and there was approximately a 10% fatality rate of those cases, but a lot of the symptomology was restricted to the lungs within those patients. In 2009, a related coronavirus uh, that's referred to as MERS, this is the Middle Eastern virus, the reservoir at that time was known as camels. It can also infect bats as well. And 27 countries were impacted, 2,500 confirmed cases, and a fatality rate of 34%. So we have the fatality rate going up. There was another MERS outbreak about 2015 that was in South Korea. So these diseases are, are cycling within their natural hosts and they will occasionally uh, cause human outbreaks. Now we have the SARS-CoV-2 of 2019. Um, began within China. Uh, bats are the known reservoir. There are now eight subtypes of the virus that are causing the pandemic. It is 98% identical to other bat isolates. It is present in all countries. There are now just under 4 million confirmed cases as of yesterday. And worldwide, there's 247,000 deaths with a average case fatality rate of 6.9%. And the difference with this SARS is that we not only have these symptoms of the uh, impact on the lungs, but also as the infection lingers, we will get subsequent impact on uh, other tissues. The kidneys were impacted by MERS, but now with the current SARS, we have uh, a lot of systemic effects, which includes the ability to cause thrombotic events within the host, and we've also heard cases of uh, sensory perception, but these are secondary symptoms. And really there's a very long list of these other symptoms that are associated with, with uh, the current coronavirus outbreak. Now, I just like to stress, this is what makes it difficult to diagnose the disease because many of these symptoms will not come on for a week to two weeks, sometimes up to three weeks after initial infection. So I'm going to go over briefly the molecular aspects of coronaviruses, because this is very important when we are searching for a antiviral drug or an antiviral approach. We need to be able to stop some part of the virus life cycle. So first, the virus must attach. And here's the spike protein. The spike protein attached to the ACE2 or DPPR. So anything that would block the binding of the spike protein to the host cell and that's where monoclonal antibodies will play a big role. Um, you'd be able to block the infection. Subsequently, once the virus attaches, it will be endocytosed into the cell. The, these vesicles will then reduce their pH level. It activates proteases so that releases the fusogenic epitope of the spike protein. And so now the membranes can fuse and this re results in the uncoating and the release of the genomic RNA into the cytosol. So anything that would prevent the maturation of endosomes, the reduction of pH, or prevents the activity of the proteases, those would also be able to block the virus. A lot of attention is being paid to this part. Because this is a positive single-stranded RNA virus, that RNA genome acts as a message RNA immediately, and so it gets translated. So in order to block this translation step, there's host machinery that's used, but there's also a unique aspect in that a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will read this to create more copies of the genome for future viral generations. So in order for the virus to replicate, it has to do the uh, go against the central dogma of transcription and translation, and that is it needs to make a copy of the RNA. So the virus must encode its own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And so that is also a target uh, that's going to be a recurring theme, that anything that the virus does, that in fact is going to be a target for a potential therapy. So there's a lot of research and effort in, in each one of these aspects, and I just want to stress that this has been going on since 2002, the research into coronaviruses. So the fact that we do not have a coronavirus specific drug at this time, just stresses how difficult it is to block viral replication and especially block viral replication within the host. Uh, lastly, once we have the 
the genome replicated, we have translated more viral protein. The virus, the new viruses are going to assemble at the ER Golgi interface. This is also referred to as ergic. The virus will assemble and then will get subsequent release by exocytosis. And there's uh, a lot of evidence that suggests that exocytosis is also simultaneous with apoptosis or host cell death to increase the ability of the virus to be released. So the therapeutic approaches that, uh, that basically everyone uh, is taking is that one, they wanna use something that will take direct action against the virus. So this is direct antiviral activity against one of those uh, aspects of viral life cycle. The other one is to reduce the amount of damage to host cells to reduce pathogenesis. Now I just have, I mentioned here corticosteroids, so they would reduce inflammation because it's the inflammation within the lungs that brings in the, the fluid. The fluid then reduces the activity of the lungs to uh, exchange oxygen. And so the people essentially uh, will drown because they are not able to uh, oxygenate their tissues. So the, uh, the other part of supportive therapy, and since the current SARS is also able to go systemic, the corticosteroids are also being looked at in order to maintain the longevity or maintain the length of a person is alive so that they hope that the immune system will be able to turn around. Now, the reason why I mentioned corticosteroids is that this is one of the frontline drugs that is being investigated. There's, approximately, there's over 100 human trials going on throughout the world. But the reason why I'm stressing corticosteroids is that this was believed to be very helpful. However, now it's being viewed that the corticosteroids actually increase the amount of inflammation and damage if they are given at the wrong time. So as we are learning more about this virus, it is also adjusting our approach to how we would potentially treat this disease. So with our laboratory's experience in being able to uh, screen and investigate antibacterial drugs within cells, um, we thought about looking for antiviral drugs that would be able to be delivered inside of host cells and to be able to block infection. Our laboratory knows an awful lot about cellular microbiology, so we know ways to manipulate cell trafficking. Uh, we could block, or, so we have lots of tools, techniques to block uh, endosome maturation. We could block exocytosis. We could also block endocytosis of the virus inside the cell. So with that, I just want to give an example that the type of screen that's typically used is where labs will start out with an in vitro screen. They'll start with a library of compounds. They will infect cells, and then they will take those that block, those drugs that block viral replication, and then they will whittle down into a number of hits and then further investigate to come up with uh, a number of leads. So this is just an example of how um, in 2019, uh, a group from China, they searched a 2000 compound library and they used the human coronavirus OC43. This is a common uh, cold vaccine or common cold virus. Out of the 2000 compounds, they had 56 hits. They are using a recombinant screening method where the virus will uh, put off light if it's able to replicate. So they could detect replication and uh, if they detect replication, it meant that, meant that their compound was not able to inhibit the virus. Their 56 hits were then tested against the wild type OC43 virus. Only 36 of those worked. Then they looked for activity against other coronaviruses and out of that, they only came up with seven. So they started from 2000 all the way down to seven. And this is just demonstrating a high throughput system, but they're using a BSL-2 reporter system to start that. So the benefit of us doing our research here is that we are not restricted to just working in a BSL-2. What we wanted to do was work with the native virus, the wild type virus inside of the BSL-3. And what we wanted to do is we actually want to take advantage of what other people have put forward. So identify a number of hits. We are not an antiviral lab, 
per se, but we can screen antiviral drugs that others have uh, proposed or others have, have identified as leads themselves. Because we have an antimicrobial delivery system, and that would be the nanoparticle delivery system, what we believe is that we can improve the ability of leads that other people have identified and other drugs that are part of human trials, we could improve their efficacy and their delivery by putting them into nanoparticles. So that's the unique aspect that our Iowa State Research Group would be able to, uh, that we would be able to do is um, take these compounds that other people are identifying. So just from that one study, the interesting thing is that there are a wide variety of bioactivities that have been identified for these different molecules that also have antiviral activity. I broke this down to, on the left, we have antiviral and host-directed drugs. On the right, we have drugs that also exhibit antiviral activity, but these are part of antimicrobial or antiparasitic classifications. This includes oligomyosin, menensin, antimyosin, um, and valinomyosin. So we're looking at antibiotics, antifungals, and somehow they come up in these screens. This just demonstrates that small molecules have a lot of impact on different processes within a cell, within a mammalian cell. So the limitations of the current therapies and why we need to search for new therapies, although it's, it, it should be uh, inherent in the current environment that we're living in that we need new therapies, is that uh, a lot of those that are being investigated, they're not widely active against different coronaviruses. And they also ha don't have the same activity for different patient populations. And because everything is happening so rapidly, uh, many of these uses are getting what they call emergency use exemptions from the FDA. So there's not a lot of data that goes into these studies. And we don't know how this effective how effective it will be or how safe it will be for different patient populations. So there's anecdotal support. Currently, it supersedes actual clinical data. All we have to do is just mention hydroxyquinolone, and we understand that the public perception uh, outweighs many times over the actual clinical data that supports the use of such drugs. Um, I also want to stress that current drugs that are, that are being heralded as as saviors, uh, remdesivir, it does not increase survival of humans that are infected. It only shortens the duration of hospitalization from 15 days to 11 days. That's all that it does. This is very similar to Tamiflu that reduces the, the number of days under symptomology for influenza. And also, um, the more news that comes out, uh, there's a recent publication that our, uh, artemenicin um, is being used, but uh, they suspect that it's also decreasing the effectiveness because so many people are taking this anti-malarial drug that is decreasing the effectiveness of malaria in those endemic areas. There's lots of uh, off-target effects, and there are many of these therapies are limited to specific phases of the of viral infection. For example, monoclonal antibodies may not be effective against later stages of the, of the disease after the virus is, has already ravaged host tissues, and antivirals may not reduce the infection uh, to the life-threatening immune response. Basically, once the immune response starts, that's the causative or the, the, the continuing factor that, um, that leads to death. So the virus may be gone at the later stages of the disease when someone is, in fact, on a let's say on a respirator. So, um, and immune suppression given too early, I mentioned corticosteroids before, this could actually exacerbate the disease, but now what they're, what they're coming up with is a blended response where they hope that antivirals can be given early, but then that is uh, segued into uh, immune suppression and during the later stages so that they could help with, uh, with survival. So I'm putting this up here because what we would like to do is repurpose what I refer to as legacy medications. These are already approved drugs that have activity, and I should say known activity, against coronaviruses. Those in this table that have an asterisk 
are already currently under investigation in COVID trials throughout the world. We have azithromycin, an antimicrobial. We have ivermectin, an antiparasitic, chloroquine, omeprazole, famipavir. So we have a number of different drugs that are already being investigated. We believe that if we can encapsulate these and put these into nanoparticles, that we will be able to increase their efficacy. Now, one of the common element, interestingly enough, is that a lot of these drugs are in fact hydrophobic. And that increases their difficulty in their ability to be delivered. Nanoparticles have an affinity for hydrophobic drugs and we can put hydrophobic drugs in nanoparticles easier than we can a typical hydrophilic drug. So the hydrophobic drugs typically have to be given by IV. We can put hydrophobic drugs easily into nanoparticles and those can be solubilized at a significantly easier, uh, but with significantly uh, less effort. And we feel that we can put those, we can deliver that to patients better than, uh, are delivered to patients without relying on IV or intramuscular injection. So I'm just going to list here what we are doing in the laboratory now. We are amplifying uh, coronavirus 2. We are infecting Vero E6 cells. And what we will do is follow this over the, the course of 24 hours. We will treat with a number of these different potential therapies. And then at the end of this time, we will then measure viral cytopathic effects. This is typically done through an inverted microscope. We can also fix cells, bring them out and do uh, high resolution microscopy, immunofluorescent staining. We can also examine histo uh, immunohistochemistry uh, on these. We can isolate RNA and we all also can isolate proteins so that we can investigate a number of different uh, pathogenic uh, events. We've done some proof of concept where we have taken Vero cells, we have gave them a chiotropic agent, this is a detergent, Triton. So when a virus gets in and it kills and lyses the cell, those cells disappear. And we're mimicking this, this was a proof of concept that we can one, identify the cells that are disappearing, um, and two, we can also measure. So we've, we have a means to measure cytopathic effects and we can screen this in a 24 well and in a 96 well plate. After we screen in vitro, we'll be able to screen in vivo using the Syrian hamster model, uh, giving the organism or giving the, uh, the virus through the intranasal route. This was recently published a month ago that the current circulating SARS-CoV-2 will infect Syrian golden hamsters. The hamsters start to shed the virus after two days, and they are also able to transmit this to naive littermates. Uh, and modeling the mild disease in humans, these animals recover with neutralizing antibody at 14 days, and these hamsters do not die from disease. So the experimental model that we would use is that the hamsters would be in these uh, isolated cage rack systems that have HEPA filtered supply air and HEPA filtered exhaust. We treat, and then we'll be able to examine uh, tissue cytopathic effects, tissue load, uh, RNA isolation, and protein serum uh, as well. So now this is the part that I want uh, everyone to see that's interested in coronavirus, is that these are the resources that we currently have in the laboratory. We have BSL-3 strains as well as BSL-2 strains. We have the the Washington one isolate, and we're currently doing our virus amplification in the Vero E6s. We have just received the uh, uh, approval to receive the Hong Kong isolate, as well as an isolate from Italy. And the historic MERS, this is the Middle Eastern virus, this is from 2014. We want to be able to compare some of these strains and also for BSL-2 purposes, uh, we wanna be able to examine other coronaviruses and the, affected, the effectiveness of any antivirals that we get through our screen on our cold circulating, I say cold, they are the viruses that are called colds in, in humans. And then um, I'll list this as a resource. And uh, what we are, we're gonna partner with the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab and with Karen Harmon, and they will, 
they're currently performing the human qPCR test for SARS-CoV-2. And so we will be able to bring samples out of the BSL-3 and we can get a viral genome equivalent numbers uh, from, uh, from them so that we will be able to do both cytopathic effects, uh, RNA analysis, as well as get a uh, viral genome equivalent so that we can quantify the amount of virus that is um, that's present within the cells and within tissues. So I want to wind down the talk by mentioning the number of different collaborations that are possible. One, uh, our lab is able to culture a number of these different viruses. And so because of that, we're able to share any products that could come out of the infection that you might be interested in, whether that would be protein or RNA. Um, because the coronavirus itself is not a uh, select agent, which means that the experiments are not restricted at the federal level. Paradoxically, it's because it's already present within the United States. So there's no, it's not a selective agent anymore. Um, so the SARS-CoV-2 research that we take, that we do inside of the BSL-3, there's an enormous collaborative potential with a variety of different groups. And I'll have some contact information at the end, along with some additional information about what we can do inside of the BSL-3. So I just want to uh, uh, acknowledge both my undergraduates that are helping. They're very fortunate to be able to have work. And the graduate students that are uh, tag teaming and working in shifts to get this work accomplished with starting the, the virus uh, up and going. Um, we are indebted to uh, Kathy Miller, at, uh, her lab and her students for um, helping us become virologists. So we get to be dangerous with another pathogen. And so we, we appreciate that. I should say dangerous metaphorically. We are extremely safe uh, in the lab. So um, uh, Dr. Narasimhan, his laboratory develops the uh, nanoparticles and we co-design them for the delivery of drugs. Um, and I want to list these last individuals down here because they've been very important in discussions because as a trained bacteriologist, uh, I, I have always steered away from virology. Um, however, given a number of different comparisons and similarities between coronavirus and the other agents that we're already working with, it is actually a tremendous asset to, uh, asset to be here in the vet college because there's so many experts that are right down the hall or easy enough to email and jump on a, a Zoom talk with. So I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Verhoeven, Dr. Jelesevich, uh, Dr. Harmon, and Dr. Main for their helpful discussions. So um, I have a couple last slides about the BSL-3 laboratory. And the one part I want you to take away from the BSL-3 is that as laboratory director, it's my responsibility to keep the laboratory up and running it's my responsibility to keep all of the permits and approvals in place. That is not the job of the individual investigator. That is my job as the laboratory director. So what that means is that these research facilities are available. If this is a multi-user facility, you contact me. And if you want to have your, your people work inside of the lab, we train them. You pay a fee that helps buy the PPE, the personal protective equipment. We supply that so that your people can come inside of the lab. So um, there's a number of different BSL-3 laboratories that we have at the Vet College and for Iowa State University. This just demonstrates the, or summarizes the differences between them. Uh, VMRI 46 is the current location that uh, all of our work is taking place in. And that's simply because of the number of different rooms that we have. It can also house a large, a large number of animals. Um, and I'll let it mention it before, the largest animal that we could work with is the hamster because everything has to be inside, fit inside of one of these disposable, uh, excuse me, cage rack systems. So we can work with chickens. We can put one chicken each inside of here, especially the baby chicks, and that works for avian influenza for that model system. Okay, and this is just some more information. I can make these slides available, and also I can share a lot more detailed information if you are interested. And if you 
have an inkling about a project or just some idea or some spark, send me a quick email. It really doesn't take much to investigate um, how much uh, work you would need to do. Uh, many projects for the BSL-3, they only need the laboratory for one to two months to either generate product or to generate enough re reagents so that they can then take that back to their BSL-2. So it's not something that typically uh, most labs, most collaborating labs need to be inside of the BSL-3 every single day, day in and day out. So um, one key difference about SARS that I'll mention is that SARS, it's not a select agent. So it's actually the rules are relaxed for, uh, for sharing and trafficking of materials. Uh, we don't have increased uh, scrutiny or regulation for tier one. So we can actually inactivate a lot of uh, SARS material very simply and using standard techniques that you already have approved. Um, and all of the, the, the permitting process for SARS, because it's not a select agent, this is relatively easy. It, it basically took me two days to get the permit from the CDC, since our lab was already approved for those um, non-USA strains of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So, and I just have my contact information here and some additional uh, collaboration uh, opportunities. And there are a number of different things that we're also uh, talking with other labs uh, regarding, and that includes also the, um, you know, an activation of PPE and the testing of different disinfectants. Um, there's aspects of food preparation. There's aspects of other uh, things. So the, the key thing that I want to mention is that if you're writing a proposal and you want your proposal to stand out, we can test anything that you can test in a BSL-2 with a surrogate virus or with a reporter construct system. The majority of those outcomes, those outputs and metrics, you would be able to get with a BSL-3 agent. And I think that that would really strengthen your proposal. Um, in several of the conversations I've had with other groups, all they need for the BSL-3 is, is approximately one month's worth of testing their proof of concept. They spend the rest of the year in their BSL-2 working on developing a strategy, and then it would take us two to four weeks in most cases for us to either test an antiviral that they have or test a diagnostic that they've developed. So I just wanted to, uh, to mention that and put that forward. So um, this slide will be available later. This is just a general overview for that. And so I'm just gonna come back to this. I'll leave this slide up here and uh, I will turn this over for questions. Thank you very much for your time. If anyone has any questions, they can enter it in the Q&A or raise their hand. I have a quick question, Dr. Belair, and that's how long would it take, do you think, to get an antiviral drug that would be curative? That would be curative. Uh, that is a very good, very topical, very poignant, and very important question. Uh, my hesitation belies my uh, thinking is that I don't think we would ever have a curative in that sense. Um, but what I do think will have something is to reduce the severity, kind of very similar to Tamiflu mm -hmm. with influenza. Uh, the reason being is that um, it would have to be something that you would give to a variety or you'd give to a wide population while they're still naive before they're exposed. Because uh, once the infection takes place, it, it's extremely difficult to, to cure with the virus. You almost have to let it, I would say, run its course. But um, I'd say that the hope is there, but uh, I think it's gonna be something similar where it, it won't, it, it'll help the symptoms. Um, so how soon would that happen? I think the soonest development for any drug would probably be about six months. And that's that would be extremely rapid. Now, my thoughts about vaccines are different, but, uh, and again, I would say that's just, that's just my opinion. 
that is not Iowa State's opinion. <laughs> That's just my opinion. So do you think you would get a supportive drug before a vaccine comes on the market? I think that the out of the 100 trials that are going on, about half of them are either with hydroxychloroquine or with uh, uh, remdesivir. So uh, th there are promise, there are lots of promises that, uh, that they hope pay off for those, but the, the early indication is that they aren't. The, the fact that remdesivir was actually uh, seen as a, as a beneficial drug is that they changed the, the drug clinical trial criteria after they started getting their data. So initially their data, they were going for uh, increasing survival rates. And when they didn't get that, they looked for any significant difference between the treated and untreated groups. And that's kind of an ad hoc analysis. Typically the FDA doesn't allow this on a regular basis, but um, they allowed them to change their, their criteria for success. And so their criteria was changed to the uh, reduce the uh, hospitalization. And so people were released from the hospital. Um, and I just wanna stress that these were people that were going to recover anyway. Um, they just were able to recover and be out of the hospital by 11 days versus 15 days. Now that's a benefit to the hospital because they have fewer patients and they can see more, it, they have more resources for the new incoming patients. But, uh, um, you know, that's, it, it's not a cure. Thanks. So, so yeah. the search goes on. We do have a question about what approaches to control the host inflammatory response. Okay. I am. It's in the chat. I am looking for the chat. Let's see, I'm on Q&A. Oh, there we go, okay. So what are the approaches to controlling the host inflammatory response? Um, the approaches that, that we have thought about were actually to improve antiviral responses early on. So one of them was, um, and a couple of these are being examined in human trials, and that's the uh, uh, poly-IC. So that would stimulate a, a, the cellular defense against RNA-based viruses. The other one would be to stimulate um, uh, interferon alpha type responses. And there's actually been drugs that were on the market, but have subsequently been pulled, but I think they're being, well, they're being put back in the pipeline. One is Infergen, and another one is just recombinant interferon alpha, which is essentially what Infergen is. And, you know, you give cells interferon alpha, that is what interferon alpha is supposed to do is to protect against viral infections. And that is actually the first experiment that we did in our laboratory um, with uh, BSL-2 before we got our, our BSL-3 strains of coronavirus. So that's one of the approaches that would be used. Um, and since those are already FDA approved, but for other indications, that would be far easier to, uh, to work with and to get approved by basically adding a new uh, a new finding, as the FDA calls it, for an existing drug. So I think that that's a viable approach, and that's a recombinant interferon alpha is about number 10 on our list of 100. 